so we should start with a definition, I guess, start with the what. Um, for the purposes of this session, um, we're simply describing directories as public catalogues of the software outputs of a research institution or community. Um, but as you'll see, that leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Um, but regardless, there are themes in common, particularly around curation and maintenance of such directories. So the broad objectives of this session are to, uh, is to just explain the, the importance uh, and the value in, in, in increasing the visibility and discoverability of research software in general. Now, directories aren't the only way of doing that, and maybe that's something we'll want to discuss a bit later. But we are going to focus on promoting the benefits of hosting a directory and or submitting your software to a directory, which is you know, perhaps even more important. Um, we're going to demonstrate a few directories that are out there. Um, that includes the directory itself, an instance of the directory, but also the underlying software. That can be quite uh, interesting in explaining where these systems are, are coming from and potentially their future as well. And we're going to explain some of the challenges around deploying and using directories and, and collectively how we can perhaps address some of those to, and, and come up with solutions. Um, and what we want to do there is collectively produce one or more blog posts to summarize our discussions and everyone's really encouraged to, to become co-authors of, of those posts. We're going to coordinate the note-taking and drafting those posts. But um, yeah, the more involvement we get, the better those posts are likely to be and the more useful they're going to be in explaining what we've discussed to the people who can't be here for this session. And just to say that the benefits can be quite broad here. So um, we're really keen to discuss everything to do with um, directories in their role of avoiding reinventing the wheel, fostering collaboration, uh, demonstrating impact of an institution. And we'll each be describing those respective impacts and what we've learned by deploying these directories in our, in our own talks. So this is a discussion session, so we've allocated at least half of the time for that. Um, I've emphasized that on the slide here. So first of all, um, Yuri and then me and Vanessa are gonna just sort of demonstrate what we've done. And you'll notice that there are some similarities, but also some differences in what we've done. And then we can have a, an open Q&A just for details about um, the demonstrations that you've seen. Um, and then the breakout groups, and I hope to have at least 20 minutes for that. Um, and then some reporting back, either by the facilitator, who is going to be each of me, Yuren, or, or Vanessa, if we have three breakout groups, or, or another volunteer. And then we'll describe what the next steps might be. So Yuren's going to lead with um, a demonstration of the Netherlands eScience Centre's research software directory. Over to you. Okay, uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, very good. Okay. Um, yeah, so hello everybody. My name is uh, Jurian Spax. Uh, I am a research software engineer with the Netherlands CSAN Center. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the research software directory that we uh, developed. Uh, so that is a, a content management system specifically tailored uh, to research software. Um, and if you wanna, um, uh, know why we did this or why we at some point decided uh, this was a good uh, thing to do. Um, yeah, I think uh, I cannot explain that properly uh, unless I show a picture of uh, the team. So we are about uh, 70 uh, people now uh, and uh, most of those people are uh, uh, working as uh, research software engineers and we really try to cover uh, all of research uh, in the Netherlands. So it's really from uh, astrophysics to uh, forensics to uh, ocean modeling to, um, I don't know, blo uh, bloodstream modeling. Um, but what all these people have in common is that they uh, produce a lot of software. Um, and yeah, we quickly found out that uh, it became uh, more and more difficult to track what software we had and uh, what expertise uh, uh, we had related to that software. Um, so for that, uh, a tool like a research software directory is uh, really helpful. Uh, but then a second reason is that uh, you want uh, the outside world also to know uh, what you're working on. It's not only an internal uh, demand for information, it's also the outside. You want to be transparent. It's all 
all taxpayer money that we're spending. So uh, yeah, we would like to uh, know the outside world uh, uh, what we're up to. And then as a related reason is that we, uh, is the third one that we uh, wanna be able to collect metrics. Um, sometimes uh, simply because our funders ask for them and then it's useful to have a tool. Uh, but also because uh, you want to do, um, uh, well, you want your management of the organization to be rooted in realism. Uh, and that means, uh, yeah, getting some information and keeping some information about um, yourself. And then the fourth reason is um, um, that we want to illustrate that we are actually making a scientific impact through software. The software in its own right is as, um, <clears throat> as valuable um, um, a scientific output as, uh, let's say, a research paper. Uh, and we feel that with the research software directory, uh, you can illustrate this point. Okay, so let's look at uh, the instance of the research software directory that uh, we run, uh, which is at researchsoftware.nl. Switch my screen here. Okay, so this is the index page for the research software directory. Um, it's a very uh, simple site. It basically has two types of pages. Uh, this is the index page. There's also a product page that I'll show you in a minute. Um, very simple, just a bunch of tiles. We have now about 120 or so uh, tools in here. Um, uh, well, we, you can do a simple uh, text-based uh, search, nothing fancy. And also there's uh, filters based on the technology that um, uh, is being employed with these tools and also the organizations that we are uh, working, um, uh, working together with on, uh, on a specific tool. So let's look at a tool, let's say a uh, kernel tuner. Uh, so kernel tuner is a, a program, a Python program that can uh, help you uh, tune the parameters of a, uh, a kernel, uh, a GPU program. Um, and yeah, uh, that's, uh, that can be really helpful uh, in terms of improving the performance of uh, certain programs. Um, so that's why uh, Ben, the developer of this uh, tool, he made this uh, website uh, because he wants people to know about this. Um, and ultimately, uh, the purpose of these product pages uh, is uh, of course adoption of uh, the kernel tuner and, and other tools. Um, so let's look at um, what is actually needed for people to uh, even consider adoption, right? It's, uh, you can't get there in one step. It's actually a couple of steps. And the first step is that um, you have to be able to find uh, this software. You have to be able to find this software page. Um, so f to that end, uh, what we do is uh, we put uh, schema.org um, made data in this website. Uh, and that really helps the ranking uh, in uh, search engines like Google. And then there's a couple of other uh, techniques that we use. Um, uh, if you uh, Google search engine optimization, uh, you will get a lot of uh, results uh, that tell you how you should uh, improve your sites so that uh, you get a better ranking. And we employ some of those uh, techniques. Um, so what people often forget as a second thing that's important on your uh, way to adoption uh, is that uh, once you get a visitor on your page, um, they should be able to uh, judge if whatever they just found is a, actually a solution for a problem. Uh, I feel that many uh, GitHub readmes suffer from this problem uh, because they typically immediately say um, how you want to, uh, how you should install a certain uh, tool. Uh, and that's uh, helpful, but um, it's only helpful after you decide that this is actually something uh, that is a solution to the problem that uh, you, you as a visitor are currently having, right? So yeah, you, you have to provide some uh, context for people to, uh, to make this judgment. And that's actually what we do in this uh, very short uh, snippet of text because you only have a couple of seconds for people to make up their mind. And then hopefully that convinces them to keep scrolling and keep reading. And there's actually a couple of answers uh, here to questions that they might have. Uh, and they can even read a little bit more detail uh, once they're, uh, let's say, a little bit more invested. Um, so at that point in their journey, if you will, um, uh, they're sort of leaning towards this tool maybe. And then the next thing that you need to do uh, on your way to adoption is building uh, confidence or building trust that this is actually uh, a good tool. Uh, so we do this by uh, including uh, these mentions. Uh, and they can be basically any 
content uh, uh, on the on the internet um, that uh, paint a picture of what context this tool lives in. So for instance, Ben wrote uh, a blog that is reasonably easy to consume. Uh, so it helps people quickly judge if this is actually a helpful uh, tool for them, right? And then there's also a little bit, little bit more difficult to understand, uh, but um, yeah, more, let's say serious publications, so conference papers and journal articles that you can find here. And then finally, a little bit more of the social context. So that's, uh, let's say, the type of project that you can do uh, with, this, uh, with this particular tool. And also the people who are involved in making this tool, including uh, a contact. Um, so, so that's all, yeah, important steps on, your, on the road to uh, adoption. And then the final step is that you should provide um, an explicit starting point that's really helpful. Um, so research software often is quite uh, complex. Um, uh, and yeah, it, it really helps if you, if you say, uh, go to this tutorial or uh, watch this video um, or look at this GPython notebook uh, if, you, if you're just starting with uh, this particular tool. Um, okay, so let's switch back to um, the presentation because uh, yeah, all those, um, Product pages, they are pretty nice, but of course the, they need to be filled with data. Uh, and the question is, uh, where is this data coming from? Um, and the answer is, um, well, it's more or less all uh, already um, out there. So for us, we, uh, we use uh, GitHub as a coding platform. Um, we make releases on Zenodo, which is an archiving service. Uh, and we do so um, using the GitHub Zenodo integration, which means that, that our developers, uh, our engineers, they can just uh, stay within their uh, GitHub environment. And then when they click make a new release on GitHub, Zenodo will take a snapshot of that, um, um, that particular version of the software. They will put a persistent identifier on it, a DOI, um, so that, uh, yeah, you can find that specific version back for the next, uh, I don't know, 10 or uh, even more years. So that's sort of the normal workflow for us. Uh, then in addition to that, we have Zotero, which is a reference manager. Uh, that's where we keep all our uh, output and all the papers that uh, uh, reference the tools that we make. And then lastly, we have uh, a blogging platform, uh, Medium, uh, and we harvest some information from there to uh, sort of spice up the pages that you saw for uh, Kernel Tuner as well. I guess the general idea behind all of this is that, um, yeah, you should, try to let engineers work in their comfort zone as much as possible, right? If you, um, yeah, the more tools that they need to use outside of their comfort zone, yeah, the less likely they'll, they'll be to um, uh, yeah, keep supplying this uh, uh, data that you really need to uh, keep your instance, uh, your research software directory alive. Okay, so um, let's jump over to what the uh, admin interface looks like because the admin interface is uh, what ties all these sources of information uh, together. Um, okay, so here you go to researchsoftware.nl slash admin. And then uh, when an engineer has a new um, tool, they can just uh, click the plus and they get an empty form. Right now I'll show you the kernel tuner one because that's the one that we looked at in the rendered form. Uh, and you see that uh, uh, Ben, in this case, uh, supplied these texts. Um, um, that's basically new information. That's not information that's uh, anywhere else. So that's really something that our engineers need to supply here. Uh, but then most of the other information is actually uh, linking to uh, another place. So for instance, here you see uh, a DOI that points to Zenodo. Uh, here you see uh, uh, a URL that points to the, the relevant repositories on GitHub. Um, and then a little bit further down, here you see the, a list of mentions. So uh, yeah, you can uh, just uh, click a new mention if you, let's say you have a new paper or whatever that you want to link to uh, this software, then you can just uh, add a, uh, a click the plus here and then you get a drop down over here and you can select whatever uh, paper you think is, uh, yeah, needs to be linked to your particular software. And that way you get uh, quite rich uh, uh, software uh, pages. Um, Okay, so uh, I guess um, overall then the workflow that our engineers, um, uh, or, uh, yeah, that you need from an engineer's perspective is, let's say you have a new project, you just make your new uh, repository on GitHub, 
for that repository, you enable the GitHub Zenona integration. And from there on, basically you're uh, in GitHub. You can just make your releases as you, as you go. You don't need to worry about anything. Um, at some point you will uh, need to make uh, a product page uh, using the admin interface uh, of the research software directory. And using this enter, uh, admin interface, you will uh, be asked for this uh, concept DOI. So um, whenever you make a release, you get a DOI for the version of the software. And you get a concept DOI for uh, the collection of all versions of that software. And that includes future uh, uh, versions, right? So that's why um, we ask our engineers that they enter the concept DOI because uh, that way we can keep track of this version and all future versions. Uh, and then after that, um, yeah, they can just make their release again, uh, 020, 021. And then maybe, uh, I don't know, they write a blog or a YouTube video comes out that they want to link. Um, so they add that to Zotero and then uh, it appears in the admin interface. Uh, they can link that um, to the software page. Uh, and then again, they can go back to their comfort zone on uh, GitHub with uh, making releases and everything on the Research software directory itself uh, just uh, is updated automatically. Okay, so another question that you might have is um, uh, how to uh, get this uh, research software directory running for uh, your own institution or your own group. Um, so the simple answer is uh, you do a git clone of the repository that you see at the bottom there, um, uh, the, the URL. Uh, then do a docker compose build, uh, put some environment variables uh, in the terminal using this uh, source command. Oh, uh, and then uh, do a Docker compose and then you have to wait a little bit, but then uh, after, uh, I don't know, a couple minutes or so, you will ab be able to see um, uh, basically the same site that I just showed you online, but then running uh, on local host on your own computer. Um, and of course that is uh, not entirely what you want because you will see our tools and you will see our papers and you will, uh, that tool will try to connect to uh, our Sotero library and our GitHub repo. So you want to probably customize all of that and configure all of that. Um, and that is all described in the README. Um, so I like to believe that uh, you can succeed in uh, making your own customizations and your own uh, configurations, but it's not really an easy or quick process. Uh, it will probably take you at least a couple of hours. Um, and uh, if you do try this and you run into trouble, then uh, by all means, uh, we're willing to help. So uh, feel free to contact us. Um, so I think I'm getting near the end in terms of time, but I would like to end with this um, small anecdote that uh, uh, that happened uh, the week before last. So the week before last, my uh, CTO, Rob, he uh, sent me an email and he said, um, uh, dear Jurian, uh, the board has asked me uh, uh, to supply them with a number. Um, uh, so could you look up uh, how many software releases we have been making this year? Um, and, I, and PS, could you uh, send me this data by Friday, this Friday? Um, and yeah, I think uh, without a tool like the Research Software Directory, uh, I, th I think that would have involved a whole lot of emailing and probably some uh, stress. Uh, but now that we have the research server directory, you can just very easy go to the API and then uh, basically ask the API for all the software information, filter the, out the releases, and then print a little list of uh, number of releases by year. And uh, that way in five minutes, you can just very easy uh, produce an overview like this. Uh, and because uh, Rob and others uh, 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 often ask me these types of questions, I made this uh, little button uh, at the top right corner of the research of a directory uh, called metrics. And if you go there, you will see something like this uh, with sort of the aggregate statistics that, uh, that people uh, have asked me about. Um, and for some of these statistics, you can even drill down into uh, the distribution uh, um, yeah, for that particular uh, aspect. So uh, with that, uh, Rob can answer his own questions. and. Uh, and other people as well, because this is all public information. So whoever uh, is wondering about, I don't know, the number of projects or the number of partner organizations or some other aspect, they can now go here and uh, see for themselves. So with that, I thank you.
Thanks, Urian. So I'm going to do a really quick demo of Imperial's research software directory, which has a similar name, but could not be more different in many respects, um, as you'll see. So I use cases that um, soon after joining Imperial, uh, I wanted a way to, to sort of showcase the, the software that existed uh, at Imperial. And so I wanted to curate a list uh, and I knew that the software was, was mostly in GitHub or GitLab repositories. Um, I wanted to get something online as soon as possible. And I was as interested in the data and the nature of that software as I was about presenting it to the world in a, in a really aesthetically pleasing way. So I just wanted to kind of what you might call serverless or zero sort of operational complexity in terms of serving it and um, putting it into production. And I, wanted, I was prepared to cut some corners there. So I was relying on a, on a third party, a non-free um, service in order to do so. So I wanted curation and maintenance to be trivial. So that means, you know, getting it online and up and running uh, and making curation as easy as possible. That means adding new software to the directory. Um, so you need to support GitHub and, and GitLab, which is mostly self-hosted um, at groups at Imperial. Uh, I wanted to, to add supplementary metadata that couldn't be retrieved directly from the respective APIs, and that includes um, DOIs for publications and information about funders uh, and um, the organisation, because often these are collaborative projects spanning uh, other academic institutions for the most part. And sometimes information from GitHub, GitHub or, or GitLab was incomplete or in some cases wrong, so I just wanted a quick way to override that. So what we have is... Um, something which provides a very limited subset uh, of, the, of the functionality provided for by, um, for example, Urian and the, the Netherlands eScience Sensors system. Um, let me share my browser. So hopefully you can see um, our directory here. Um, so at the moment, 136 software projects. Um, you, you can fa do a faceted browse by, by language or license. You can search by um, topics. So we've got various projects that, that use or, or provide um, neural nets. You can search by author. We've got one particularly prolific author here who's written projects in, in various languages. Um, you can obviously filter by, by language and then by license. So it's a single page app, it's very, very simple. Um, the code itself is um, a very basic, well, the, 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 the key of this is the, is the data behind it. So I started off by curating this long before I tried to get it online. And this was really a means of gathering intelligence about the software being written Imperial, who was writing it, uh, in what languages, to give us a better understanding, really, of the, of kind of the, the projects that um, were being produced. And you can see that these come from a whole load of GitHub organizations, um, some representing projects, some corresponding to real life institutions or, or, or projects, and others just from individuals. Um, and we retrieve the metadata data from the from the public github api and then supplement it where relevant by some dois um, project home pages where that isn't available or included in the in the github data we can override or specify a license where that's missing uh, and then generally add contact details of, of what uh, who i've identified as the primary author uh, and we have a really simple python script that, that runs through that um called site as which is a means for identifying uh, DOIs associated with, with repositories um, and basically so it does that there's two standards here one one that retrieves information from github api rob and the gitlab api i'm deliberately moving rather fast through this hastily written code and at the end it just updates it uploads a dictionary to algolia which is a third party kind of full text search um, hosted product um, you can see something that looks very familiar there from the CSV file. Uh, and then we call that using some JavaScript. So it's just a single file, some HTML, which is very, very simple. Um, bit of JavaScript. 
We use an instant, the instant search library that Algolia provide and sticks it into a very basic templating language, which they also provide as a front end library. So that's the entirety of the, of the app. It's a bit of CSS, a tiny bit of JavaScript and some HTML templating. So in order for people to contribute, they can go here, they can click on the banner, they can um, create a pull request adding at the very least the repo of their, the URL of their repo. And uh, then I merge it in and it appears on the, in the directory the next day. So to run through some of the pros and cons of this approach and perhaps why I didn't um, adopt a much more sensible solution like the Netherlands uh, eScience Centre tool. Um, so as I said, it uses PyGitHub, Python, GitLab to talk to the um, repositories, um, uses Vladiate to, to just check whether the, um, the CSV file and the resulting dictionaries are well formed. It uses Citas, which is an interesting uh, tool which you're not aware of, you should maybe check out. Algolia, as I said, we use GitHub, the GitHub API, we use GitHub pages to host the HTML page. We use actions overnight, uh, every night to supplement, uh, to call the GitHub API and update the stars and stuff, um, the star counts and the number of watchers in the last update. And we have some supporting scripts that um, at the moment are run every week and they check for new repositories from the organizations that we know about. They check that the contact details of the authors are still valid and that the and the the home pages uh, are still online. So the benefits of this is it's incredibly simple and straightforward. Um, it's a really useful showcase actually, uh, and it's well used. Um, and it provides us, as I said, with intelligence about software and a, and a mailing list actually of the um, of practicing RSEs at Imperial. Um, it provides some great repositories that we can point to to demonstrate best practice. Um, and it does highlight the strengths of the institution, as you've seen, that there's a lot of work uh, from uh, in deep learning, machine learning, um, when it comes to biomedical research. And there's obviously a lot of COVID research as well, and that's kind of demonstrated by direct, their representation in the directory. Uh, and that's really useful data. Um, also, it's, it is super lightweight. It allows for data, uh, software which isn't written at Imperial, but is contributed to by Imperial researchers. Um, and the advantage of that is um, in contrast to our institutional kind of research management system uh, is that we can, we can contribute or submit software to this uh, ourselves, which leads to a more comprehensive um, directory because it isn't relying on researchers to submit their own code. And I'd say that is the biggest difference to the, the Netherlands system in that um, we're flipping curation on its head. We, we do it all ourselves. We don't rely on anybody to, to submit their own code which means it's more comprehensive, um, but less rich. And that is also uh, a weakness because we don't add stuff we don't know about uh, and we don't always know the software as well as the authors. And the scalability, as you've seen, depends on the repository being well annotated because if, if it doesn't include contact details for the author or most recent publications, then that doesn't find its way into the metadata that we publish online. Curation is a challenge, like do we, should we include random Jupyter notebooks, course materials, or tools which just demonstrate how to use um, specific Python libraries or how to structure a repository they're useful to have online. It's good to make discoverable, but they're not research software projects in their own right. And the biggest issues perhaps is that you can't customize it very much. Um, we don't do, because it's not highly curated, we're not recommending or suggesting that these projects um, are better written than others. We don't, we don't rate them, we don't certify them. Um, we just say that they, they have an association with Imperial. There's no SEO, unlike um, the RSD that you're presented. And at the moment it relies on a third party uh, a, a, with, a free, with a freemium model. Um, but I'd love to switch it to something like um, uh, Maily search, which provides the same functionality, um, but you could sell post. So in short, um, this is at the other end, embarrassingly far to the other end of the spectrum compared to, to Urian's solution. And it only exists because I wanted to scratch an itch and I wanted to be data driven, like updating a CSV file simple. Um, but I would not recommend this approach at home. It, it's instructive to compare with something um, like the RSD, which um, it does have a lot of moving parts, um, more than I was prepared to tolerate or understand at the time. Um, but if you do have the time to customize it, and it is as simple as Docker Compose up, it really is. I, I did I did try that and it worked. Then you know I I definitely recommend taking 
taking that approach. But it's been an interesting exercise in, in learning the pros and cons of each approach. Um, and the underlying issues still remain, the issues re regarding curation and data quality. So, I mean, they're common in however you present your, your directory. So that's all I have to say about, about that. And I think Vanessa is going to present a couple of slightly different projects, but with some similar themes. Okay, let's share my screen. All righty, do you guys see my screen? Thumbs up? Okay, great. Yes, we do. So hi, yeah. hi everyone, I'm Vanessa. I'm from the Stanford University Research Computing Center. And today I'm going to be talking to you about a different kind of software directory, the Research Software Encyclopedia. And specifically why we started to kind of put it together this year, it's all focused around answering this question of what is research software. But before that, let's zoom back in time, back to the year 2019, when things were very different and there we are, we're lying in our bed, what the heck are we thinking about? Well, we're research software engineers, so very likely we are thinking about our code. How do I write that script? How do I build that container? And specifically for us in the United States, because USRC is fairly new, we were asking a lot of questions about definition. What is a research software engineer? What is it exactly that I do? And we had very good reason to ask these questions. So for example, we may have just needed help with institutional project or funding so we could keep our jobs. Maybe we wanted to become a part of this growing international community. Everyone on this call right now, what you guys are in and doing is awesome and we wanna be a part of that. And we also might wanted to have created more training and career opportunities so it's not sort of a dead end road when you graduate. But I'm sorry folks. <laughs> That was the past. We all know we're in 2020 with the Corona apocalypse and fires and like oh, killer bees, I can't even say. And we're thinking about a lot very different questions, uh, questions about that are wor around, centered around worry. Where can I get this thing? Oh my gosh, are my parents okay? And because we're asking a lot of these more introspective questions about our self-worth, we're really reassessing the roles that we have in our communities, not just our families, like providing for my family because I have a job, but also in our research communities, what value am I adding as an RSE? And sort of like before, the questions that we ask are focused around what's happening at the time. So what are we thinking about now? Well, maybe we're saying, you know, is my software going to be considered for this grant? because, oh my goodness, if I don't get this grant, I'm not gonna get funding and I'm, my role might be in jeopardy and I'll lose my job. And can I actually publish this work as research software because I've worked so hard on it and I submitted to this journal and they told me, they told me it wasn't research software. Do I even work on research software? You know, having a mini identity crisis here. How is my institution going to decide about funding? And oh my God, how is my institution going to decide about me? And so I hope you see that all of these questions sort of manifest together in this larger question of being able to answer what is research software. And so this is kind of what we put on our, our dinosaur hazmat suits uh, many months ago in the beginning of 2020. And we say, huh, this is an important question. This is relevant today. How do we answer this question? And there's kind of three ways you can go about it. You can first say, you know what? I am an expert, I am going to publish a paper and I'm going to tell people what research software is because I know the right answer. But you might also say, you know, my one opinion is limited, but if I put together a committee of these experts, they together can come up with a better definition. But the third approach says, you know what, even a committee of experts is a really biased sample because they have to be people that are called experts and they have to have the time to be on a committee. So let's take an approach to ask the community. And this third approach is what we really wanted to do with the Research Software Encyclopedia. So without further ado, the Research Software Encyclopedia is a community-driven open source effort. It takes this idea that it shouldn't require substantial work, funding to maintain it. We, and it also takes this approach that, you know what? There's no way all these people are going to agree. I mean, no one ever agrees. We're never gonna be able to define a holistic definition to satisfy everyone, but, we can answer questions about software, so criteria, and we can also put it in categories such as a taxonomy. And then based on some use case that we have, we can use those as filters to sit, give a yes, no answer for our particular use case. And guess what? It should be fun because research software is awesome. Like why should we not be having fun? So 
what do we need abstractly? Let's put on our, our thinking hats. This is sort of where we're thinking about it many months ago. The first thing is we probably need these criterion taxonomy items, like literally lists of things, the taxonomy would be sort of a nested hierarchy. We then would probably want software to manage and interact with some database of research software. Once we have that, of course, well, we can create the database and we can add software to that. And then we're going to use that tool to annotate the, the, the database with criteria and taxonomy items. And so these three abstract things actually came together to become the RSCpedia. And so that's what we're going to talk about very quickly now, the three components, the criteria and taxonomy, tools to interact, and then the actual database. Starting with criteria and taxonomy. So if you go to the research software criteria and taxonomy page, you see a nice human friendly interface. Here you can explore the criteria. So here's our examples. Would taking away the software be a detriment to research? Has the software been cited? Is it intended for a particular domain? And you can also browse taxonomy. This is just sort of the nodes at the end in the hierarchy, and this is just a small set of those. You can also browse it interactively with D3. So this is one of those, probably some of you think very annoying plots that you click and it zooms in and it shows you the, all the, the children that are nested. And Importantly, all of this is open source and version controlled on GitHub. So if you're just interested in working on the criteria of taxonomy, this is the repository that you contribute to. These, this, this is where the data files are found. And it's also installable as a Python package. So if you show up one day and you're like, hey, I want to do research with that uses these criteria, criteria and taxonomy items, there is a Python package to do that with functions. But you don't have to because the interface also serves a static API for essentially accomplishing the same. This is what that looks like. Here on the left, we see the taxonomy. On the right, we see the criteria. Okay, so gosh, why should I care, Vanessa? You've shown me lists of things that maybe I could come up with in 30 minutes. The reason this is important is actually centered around community. So every week we have the software showcase where you say, hey, here's a cool open source software thing that maybe you didn't know about. Here's a little about it, some interesting facts, some tutorials, how to get started. If you have some time, you can annotate. And so we do this on a weekly basis and we share on social media. And the reason this is so important is because if this entire effort is just like a total failure, if it's the case that we influence just a few people by way of sharing software, make someone aware of something they didn't know about before, that I consider a success because working with people is so much harder than working with tools. That said, we do have tools, so we'll talk about that next. The research software encyclopedia software, also open source and version control, here it is in its lovely GitHub repo. And it has, it provides a command line client that provides all these commands that you'd expect when you're interacting with a database. So see if something exists, add it, get it, scrape, update, list, label, export, clear, export, summary, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, here I am on the command line, I'm like, okay, I wanna take a look at the entry for SPAC. Probably here, people here are familiar with SPAC. Um, flexible package manager supports multiple versions, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so here you see that it's a GitHub package. It has a lot of metadata that comes directly from the GitHub API, and then it has a DOI. And importantly, the software also lets you do this thing called annotation. You can annotate locally, either one repository and in bulk. Here's what that looks like. So on the top, we're saying, okay, I wanna start a session for either the taxonomy or the criteria. And then it shows you on the command line, you know, what do you think about this, this question? And you answer yes or no. But we don't really need a headless environment, right? So actually, if you run RSC start, it'll open up an interactive annotation interface where you can click to annotate criteria, the taxonomy. Here's what it looks like to annotate the taxonomy. So this is for SPAC. So you look down this list, you look at the hierarchy, you say, ah, I think this is related to package management, which I very poorly truncated there at the bottom. <laughs> Here is what annotating the criteria looks like. So you basically, it's those same questions you saw before. You can answer yes, no, or I'm unsure. And the really cool part is that when you're done an annotation session, all that you've done is made changes to version control. So you'd push those changes up to your fork, you'd open a pull request, and you'd make changes to the RCpedia in the same way that you'd make changes to software, which I think is really cool. So finally, this database, I've been kind of talking about this database. You probably have noticed that we're talking about a GitHub repository. So the RCpedia, uh, by default, since I wanted it to be on GitHub, the database that we're sort of all sharing, this, this community database, is sort of a flat file system database. However, the RCpedia can also create relational databases if that's what you need for your use case. So it's also open source and version controlled. 
The software itself is namespaced by the version control system. And this was a choice because we believe that although there's many different DOIs across many different things, the source code is really the most truthiest, that's the best way I can put it, that we'd want to use to describe uh, the software. And also in the docs folder, there's a static annotation interface. There it is in all its glory. This is what that looks like. So you can go to the, the interface associated with the GitHub repository and sort of look at the software and, and click on different ones if you want to annotate. And guess what? The annotation interface looks exactly the same. But huh, you're probably saying, how does that work? Because it's not like I'm going to go to a GitHub pages site and then have it write to my file system. And you're right, <laughs> that would not work. So the way that it works is that when you submit for either of these, it opens up an issue. It says, okay, I want to annotate this repository. Here's my taxonomy I've chosen, or here's the answer to the criteria question. If you look down here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that triggers a GitHub action. And the GitHub action basically makes those changes on your behalf and then opens the pull request. And then someone looks it over and approves it and it's merged. So again, if you want to annotate in the interface, it literally is just a couple of clicks and then everything just happens. So how do we add software? How, because like this, this could be hard too, right? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can add it in bulk. So for example, when I was first making the RCPedia, I wanted to add everything from NumFocus and I had this big list. So I made that list and I added it via a file. You can also add one off the bat. So, you know, I may be publishing the software showcase for the week and I find a really cool package and I say, oh, I got to add this, so I'll do it like that. But this is manual, this is hard. We don't want manual and hard, we want automated. And so that's why we have these scrapers. And actually these scrapers are scraping some uh, resources we already talked about today. Um, so basically what happens is that this will uh, automatically update the RCPedia at some frequency. So we run the scraper on a weekly basis. So for example, here it is running to update just, uh, and then it opens a pull request and just needs an approval. So how do we analyze software? Well. Let's say that I'm interested in Singularity Registry Server, which has a particular GitHub address. I would basically do RC Analyze, and then it gives me basically a summary of view of the criteria, so a majority rules sort of thing, and you can adjust the thresholds. And the same for the taxonomy. And I can adjust the thresholds for my use case and basically use the data however I need. So in summary, the Research Software Encyclopedia is actually, ironically, agnostic to whether something is or isn't research software, but it gives us a better means to communicate about software because we can say the criteria that, and the taxonomy categories that are important to us. And it empowers the user to decide based on their use case. So I wanna point out that although we're doing this annotation, you don't technically need to use any of the annotations. You may just be interested in saying, you know what, I'm running a journal and I'm going to say that these criteria and taxonomy items are what I'm qualifying, what I'm calling research software for people to submit. So there's good communication about that. And it creates awareness and excitement for research software. Just this weekly post, I, I think more people need to be excited about it. And in summary, it's, it's all open source and version controlled. It doesn't require long-term investment for automation or hosting or doesn't require a lot of manual work It's updated automatically. So how do you get involved? There are many different ways. If you're really just interested in learning about software and annotating, then I encourage you to look for this weekly software survey post. I usually put them on Twitter and different slacks. And it's really just a couple of clicks if you also want to give back and annotate the software for that week. If you really care about working on the criteria taxonomy items, as we already showed you, there is a GitHub repository and you can open an issue, make a pull request, that sort of thing. If you care about the larger project and the vision for the RCPedia, then we invite you to be a co-author on our paper. I know you can't click that link, but I'll send you the slides and you will be able to. If you really just like building things, which is okay, I like, I'm one of those people, and you just wanna work on the software, then you probably working on the RCPedia software would be what you might want to do. And finally, if you're just really excited to learn about software, or you wanna do something that I didn't mention here, then you can, you know, suggest uh, software survey, so, suggest a piece of software to be really uh, shared on the software survey, write the post yourself, or something that I haven't even thought of that, uh, that you've thought of, like any way that you want to contribute, totally please reach out. So what can we imagine when 2020 is hopefully over? Well, 2021, maybe a little bit later, we want to be confident that our work qualifies for some grant that we're applying to. We want to know that our institution understands and values our software. And 
that the criteria and categories that a journal are looking for when we submit something are clear and there's not this miscommunication going on. And we really want to better understand our own roles in this larger, the context of this larger funding plan for science. Okay, so if you want to reach out to me, that's my email and my social networks. And I am also gonna be presenting the next research software directory. So I'm just gonna keep talking if that's okay with everyone. Thumbs up. Yes. Okay, cool. So going back to the Imperial College London directory, I actually stumbled on this and I said, this is awesome. I want to do this for, you know, my personal GitHub or maybe for my institution. And I, I literally went through that source code um, that Mark was showing earlier. And I saw the, you know, the Allogia thing. And I said, oh no, I have to make an account on Allogia. I don't want to do, I'm one level lazier than that. I didn't want to do that. And so what I did is I put together the <laughs> search for GitHub pages, which is very much the same interface. It's, it's slightly different. So you won't see counts on the left side. But the basic idea is that uh, probably some of you know that GitHub pages metadata for an organization or will for an organization will serve metadata for all the GitHub repositories that you have. So for this particular software encyclopedia, all you need to it's one again it's one level lazier. All you need to do is fork it and then have the automated GitHub action work to just build it on a weekly basis, and you'll get that same interface. So. I think that is all I got.